I invite you to turn with me in your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 22. This is our text this evening as we continue our ex- ex- uh, exposition of this book. 2 Kings chapter 22. Let's give our careful attention to God's inspired and infallible word. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozka. He did right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father David, nor did he turn aside to the right or to the left. Now in the 18th year of King Josiah, Josiah the King sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkiah, the high priest, that he may count the money brought into the house of the Lord, which the doorkeepers have gathered from the people. Let them deliver it into the hand of the workmen who have oversight over the house of the Lord, and let them give it to the workmen who are in the house of the Lord to repair the damages of the house to the carpenters and builders and the masons for buying timber and hewn stone to repair the house. Only no accounting shall be made for them for the money delivered into their hands, for they deal faithfully. Then Hilkiah the high priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave, it, gave the book to Shaphan, who read it. Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought back word to the king and said, Your servants have have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. Moreover, Shaphan the scribe told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Then the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam the son of Shaphan, Achbor the king, uh, the son of Micaiah, Shaphan the scribe, and Asaiah uh, the king's servant, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me, and the people, and all Judah concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that burns against us, because our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. So Hilkiah the priest, Ahikam, Akbor, Shaphan, and Asaiah went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tikvah, the son of Harhas, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter, and they spoke to her. She said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man whom you sent to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I bring evil on this place, and on its inhabitants, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read. Because they have forsaken me and have burned incense to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the work of their hands. Therefore, my wrath burns against this place, and it shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, regarding the words which you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and you've torn your clothes and wept before me. I truly have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes will not see all the evil which I will bring on this place. So they brought back the word 
to the king. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please, and let's go to the throne of grace once more to seek God's blessing on the preaching and the hearing of his word. Our God, as we come to your word uh, this evening, uh, we pray for insight, we pray for understanding, we pray for illumination through the ministry of the Holy Spirit implanted in our hearts that we might understand, we might know your will, and that we might obey your holy word. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God's word has the power to change the course of one's life. There are some prominent examples of this in church history. Think back on Augustine in the fourth century, who in his work Confessions recounts that he was sitting in a garden when he heard, uh, overheard a, a little child's voice in saying in Latin, tole lege, meaning pick up and read. He picked up the Bible, and he read Romans 13, 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lust. That passage addressed Augustine's besetting sin and was uh, the catalyst for his repentance unto life and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're even more familiar with the 16th century Augustinian monk, Martin Luther, whose encounter with the book of Romans changed the course of his life. Luther was burdened in his soul because nothing he did in his efforts to please God relieved his guilty conscience. The turning point came in connection with Romans 1.17, for in it, that is the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Formerly, Luther had understood the righteousness of God as an active, retributive, punishing righteousness that demanded a man keep the whole law of God, which Luther knew all too well that he couldn't do perfectly. He came to the point Luther writes that he hated God for requiring this righteousness of him. But then came his uh, evangelical breakthrough in the course of teaching the book of Romans at the University of Wittenberg. When he came to understand that the righteousness of God was something that God gives to man freely through faith, in Jesus Christ. Perhaps like Augustine or Luther, you can point to a particular verse or or passage that led to your conversion, was a catalyst for significant progress in your Christian life, or a great comfort to you in a time of trouble. Josiah's encounter with God's word changed the course of his life and the course of the nation of Judah, leading to significant reformation in the southern kingdom. When the boy Josiah came to the throne at eight years of age, there were very few people alive who would have remembered the reforms of his great-grandfather, Hezekiah, in 2 Kings 18, and now nearly six decades in the past. 
these reforms, you remember, had been systematically dismantled by Hezekiah's son, Manasseh, when he took the throne, 2 Kings 21, and Josiah's father, Ammon, had continued the downward slide. And now under Josiah, Reformation bursts into life again. And instead of the immediate exile that we might expect, after chapter 21 and that horrid description of Manasseh's reign, we find in chapter 22 an even more comprehensive series of reformation and reform in, uh, than, than Hezekiah himself carried out. Why now, we might ask, why after 55 years of idolatrous decline in the nation of Judah, and another two on top of that, under Ammon, the son of Manasseh. Well, in one sense, this is the mystery of God's providence. But in another, 2 Kings 22 shows us that God uses his word to bring revival and reformation when he pleases to do so. God uses his word to change lives, to bring revival and reformation when he's pleased to do so. We'll look at three things together. The text divides uh, pretty neatly into three sections. In the first place, the king's faithfulness to God's law. Secondly, the priest's discovery of God's law. And thirdly, prophetic clarity regarding God's law. The king's faithfulness to God's law, the priest's discovery of God's law, prophetic clarity regarding God's law. In the first place, then, the king's faithfulness to God's law. What we read uh, in our text uh, indicates that Josiah was showing faithfulness to God's law even before the reforms that he carried out in Judah. Now with uh, King Josiah Another light shines in darkness. Fresh air begins to blow into Judah uh, with eight-year-old Josiah's ascension to the throne. He joins seven other kings of Judah who do what is right in Jehovah's eyes. But only two other kings share with him the unqualified praise of also walking in all the ways of his father, David. This, this puts Josiah in league with his great-grandfather, Hezekiah, 2 Kings 18.6, and his distant ancestor, Asa, 1 Kings chapter 15, uh, verse 11. Now, as a boy of uh, only eight years old, it would inevitably be some years before he was able to establish the direction of the kingdom. The chronicler tells us that at the age of 16, in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still a youth, he began to seek the God of his father, David, and four years after launched his great reformation. 2 Chronicles 34, verse 3. The king's narrator zeroes in on Josiah's 18th year in verse 3, 622 B.C., when he was 26 years old. The Chronicles account focuses on chronology, reformation, then discovery of the law. 
But 2 Kings takes a topical or a thematic approach, honing in on the discovery of God's word, which is the, the premier event that served as the catalyst for Josiah's reformation in Judah. One further detail is added in verse 2, uh, something that's not said of any other king of Judah. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. This is an allusion to Deuteronomy 17, where Moses says that a king which was to come uh, was to write for himself a copy of the law and to read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by observing carefully all the words of this law and these statutes and that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right or the left so that he and his sons may continue in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. There's also an echo here of 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, the words uh, that David spoke to Solomon when he took the throne, which we identified uh, in our exposition of that passage a long time ago, it's been, as the key to understanding the whole of the king's narrative. 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, uh, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons are careful of their way to walk in me, uh, before me in the truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. You understand what the inspired writer of Second Kings is telling us here by this favorable comparison to David, by alluding to the job description of a faithful king in Deuteronomy chapter 17, and by the echo of David's charge to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 2. He puts Josiah in a league of his own, whose faithfulness to God's commandments will sweep away nearly six decades of gross idolatry under Manasseh and Ammon. The king's record of Josiah's faithfulness begins with uh, the temple repairs in verses 3 to 7 of our text. Uh, this early work recalls uh, that of the earlier king Josiah, in 2 Kings chapter 12, uh, but if you remember, the outcome is quite different. Presumably, Shaphan had been uh, Josiah's mentor during his younger years and is now sent out by the king uh, to carry out uh, the work in the temple. The temple had fallen into disrepair. Uh, there's far more detail in 2 Chronicles 35, about the temple repairs, whereas Josiah's reforms in uh, the next chapter, in chapter 23 of 2 Kings, focus on the, the undoing of Manasseh's idolatry. The difference doesn't imply any contradiction in these two accounts of uh, King Josiah's reign. Here, uh, the king's industry and honesty in uh, the temple officials and the financial matters are emphasized, but the focus is on Josiah's faithfulness to God's word, 
his faithfulness already, uh, even before uh, what we're going to see in, as we move on here, even before that time, uh, Josiah was faithful to God's word. But what he did in those early reforms in the temple uh, is overshadowed by, secondly, the priest's discovery of the law. The Hebrew is emphatic. Hilkiah the priest says to Shaphan the scribe, verse 8, the book of the law I have found in the house of the Lord. Hilkiah gives it to Shaphan the scribe who reads it, and when he comes to the king to report the progress made in the repairs of the house of the Lord, he also tells the king again emphatically in the Hebrew in verse 10, a book Hilkiah the priest has given to me, and he reads it to the king. Now, what was this book, and how was it lost? The consensus among interpreters is that it was almost certainly the book of Deuteronomy. One reason for this phrase is the one reason for it is the phrase, uh, the, the book of the law, which is the characteristic term uh, of referring to Deuteronomy in chapters uh, thir- 28 through 31, for example. Additionally, as we'll see in 2 Kings 23, the reforms that Josiah carried out as a result of reading the book of the law focused on the restoration of worship in Jerusalem which is one of Deuteronomy's major themes. Certainly the reforms had already begun before the discovery of the book, as we've said, that has a, uh, Josiah was, uh, was uh, faithful to, to the word uh, of the Lord. But we need to remember that uh, Kings is thematic rather than chronological of, uh, of, of Josiah's reign. And as to how this book had fallen out of its divinely ordained influence in Judah, the overwhelming probability is that it hadn't been accidentally lost, but deliberately suppressed by Josiah's grandfather, Manasseh, hidden someplace in a dark corner. The text also places major attention on Josiah's trembling in response to the discovery of the book of the law. In verse 11, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. Now, in biblical times, remember that the tearing of one's clothes was an outward indication of inward distress. And in Josiah's case, uh, it was a clear sign of repentance. The more Josiah heard about what God required, the more clearly he saw how far short Judah had fallen from the glory of God, especially in the practice of worship. He trembled to think how long Judah had neglected the law of God. Temple repairs were necessary as far as they went. The house of the Lord was in disrepair. It needed to be set back in order. But what really required, what was really required of of God's people was faithfulness, a heart of faithful devotion to his word. And when the king saw the massive difference between the way God's people were living and what God's law said concerning them. When he thought about the resulting judgment, it pierced his soul. In a word, he repented. And that's how God's word operates. The word of God, the writer 
to the Hebrew says, is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joint and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And after this discovery, like all who genuinely respond to Scripture, the king wanted to know more and to plan his future actions accordingly. And so he orders this five-man commission to go and inquire of Jehovah, verses 12 and 13. Josiah wants prophetic direction. He wants light uh, on the matter since he recognized that Jehovah's wrath burned against his realm because, he says to them, our fathers have not listened to the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. And that brings us then, thirdly, to prophetic clarity concerning God's law. Now, in first reflection, it might be surprising that the officials go to otherwise unknown Huldah, the prophetess, rather than going to Jeremiah, who was then in, his early, in the early years of his prophetic ministry, or Zephaniah, who also prophesied in those days. But there's a valuable lesson for us here. The book of the law was God's word through Moses. And there's no authority in the Old Testament that bypasses or supersedes that of Moses. What the king and his commissioners were looking for wasn't another word. They weren't looking for a greater authority, uh, someone who would modify what they'd read in the book of the law, but for an authentic interpreter who would apply it faithfully to their times. And Holda, the prophetess, fulfilled that role faithfully. Her message is clear and uncompromising. It's worth noting the two ways in which she refers to Josiah. First, tell the man who sent you to me. In verse 15, that shows the authority with which she speaks. Kings and their subjects are on level ground before God's word. All need to hear and tremble before it. Secondly, then in verse 18, but the king of Judah who sent you shows that she indeed has respect for King uh, Josiah. She does have uh, respect. She does honor the king who will obey God's word at all costs. In true pro prophetic fashion, there are two sides to Hulda's message. First, there's a word of judgment in verses 16 and 17. Idolatry and unfaithfulness to the covenant will be punished, and there will be no reprieve. As we've said throughout our exposition of the king's narrative, this is first commandment stuff. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. God's people have violated his covenant word, provoking Jehovah to anger. Therefore, his wrath burns against them, and it will not be quenched. 
Second, there's a word of mercy in verses 18 to 20. In wrath, God remembers mercy. A wondrous thing. The word of the mercy of, of mercy comes here to the to the, the king who who has repented, uh, who has sought to obey the Lord. The day of disaster uh, would be deferred for Josiah. There would be time for him to be gathered to his grave in peace before the great and terrible day of judgment. That's the message of hope that the five-man commission brought back to King Josiah here in verse 20. Now, no doubt, Huldah's prophecy was difficult for King Josiah to hear. But there's, there's a word for us here. There's a word today, for today, for God's church today. Uh, her words are helpful for us uh, in the 21st century. Uh, we live in a gloomy, difficult time for the church of Jesus Christ, a time of great spiritual decline uh, in the church. And in such times, it's tempting to think that we have simply reached the point of no return, uh, that there's no turning back from here. What should we do about it? What does the message of King Josiah and his reforms, and notwithstanding those, his obedience to the law and those reforms, of this word of judgment that comes. What to do? What, what should we do as, as God's people? One thing we can do is seek to live for God's glory seeking the spiritual reformation of the church and the gospel transformation of society. That's what King Josiah did. Uh, we'll see uh, that uh, even more of that in 2 Kings 23. Josiah was light in darkness. He sought to do everything that he could to restore proper worship no matter how many obstacles he faced. Furthermore, we need as a church of Jesus Christ and as individual members of the body of Christ to develop the right kind of expectancy. We never know what God may be about to do. God uses his word to change lives, to bring revival and reformation when he pleases, no matter how, the dark, how dark the times may be, no matter how unlikely it may seem uh, that he's going to act, that he's going to send his spirit in revival and reformation in the church. God's word is the driving force of every genuine reformation. The book discovered wasn't a new invention, but the rediscovery of the living word that had been suppressed for decades. There's simply no telling what God may do when he chooses to unleash his word upon the world and upon the culture in which we live. And you and I must be diligent in working towards reformation, praying for revival and reformation in the church of Jesus Christ. 
But at the same time, God calls us to be realists. We need to recognize, we need to realize that while God blessed Josiah for his faithfulness to keep the law, it was too little, too late to save Judah. As godly as this good king was, he could not save his people from destruction. As we strive to follow this great reformer's, uh, ancient reformer's, work in uh, his example in Reformation. We need to recognize that striving to do what's right in the eyes of God will never be enough to save us or deliver us, and never be enough to, uh, to deliver our culture from idolatry. This is one of the hard lessons of 2 Kings 22. We've been on something of a roller coaster here. Hezekiah pops up, this uh, seemingly out of nowhere, and uh, initiates tremendous reforms in Judah. And then comes Manasseh. And now, uh, after that dive, we're uh, on the upward trend again under Josiah. But we know how uh, the book of 2 Kings ends. It ends with Judah in exile in Babylon. Our efforts to keep God's law can't save us, and they can't deliver us from the ungodliness of the culture in which we live. And they can't bring reformation. They can't bring revival. Only God's spirit, only God's power can bring revival. So as righteous uh, as, as Josiah was, and he was as righteous as any king of Judah before him, he sought to keep God's law. He did so perhaps better than any of his forefathers had ever done. Yet the law is powerless to save. It's powerless to deliver. What we need Therefore, is someone who can save us from the law and from the sins that the law condemns. We need the righteous king that Josiah and all the other less than perfect kings of Judah teach us to look for and long for. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to... Uh, the way Paul speaks about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. For what the law could not do, weak as it was, through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's Paul's way of helping us to understand that the law can't save or or deliver anyone. Martin Luther said it well when he defended the gospel at a theological disputation in Heidelberg, according to Luther, the law says, do this, and it's never done. Grace says, believe this, and everything is already done. Everything is done because Jesus has done it. We see a remarkable example of saving faith and true repentance in Josiah's response to God's word, which is what set the king and the kingdom of Judah on this upward trajectory, the right trajectory. And yet judgment was still coming. Judah's sins were so great that God's wrath could not be averted. 
Nevertheless, Huldah's prophecy gives hope to every penitent heart that bows in humility before God. Our prayer of confession has been heard. Our cry for mercy will be accepted. Final judgment will still come. But when everything else is wiped away, our lives will be spared by the grace that God has stored up for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We look to you, our God and Father, as a righteous God, one who's given us his law to show us that we can't keep it perfectly, to show us how desperately we need our Lord Jesus Christ to be delivered from the curse of the law, to enter into everlasting life through Christ's righteousness imputed to us, reckoned to us, credited to us by faith, and to be saved from the burning anger that you will pour out upon all on the great day of judgment. And we recognize as well, O oh Lord, uh, that we can't affect revival, that we cannot bring reformation, that you alone, working through the power of your word and your spirit, can do these things. And so we cast ourselves upon you, O oh Father, and we do pray, even now, together, for revival in your church. We pray, O oh Lord, that repentance would begin with the household of God. We pray that you would remember your promise that if your people who are called by your name would humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways and seek your face, that you would hear from heaven that, and that you would heal your holy people. We pray, O oh God, that you would bring uh, that you would bring in our day what we have not seen in our lifetime. Our fathers have seen these things. They've seen a great and refreshing times of the movement of your Holy Spirit, awakening dead souls, and, uh, people pressing into the kingdom of God. We've seen, uh, they have seen, O oh Lord, uh, times of great refreshment in uh, the rediscovery of uh, biblical worship in the church, greater attention to your word, greater focus on uh, the ordinances that you've given the church to worship you. We pray, our God, that you would hear us as we cry out to you and make us those who are diligent in uh, praying in this way. We cannot express We have no words, O oh Lord, to express our deep gratitude for the salvation that you've brought us through our Savior, Jesus Christ, for delivering us from slavery to sin, for bringing us out of uh, the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of light. And we pray, O oh God, that you would continue your work of salvation in us, that you would continue uh, your work of deliverance, that you would build your church, O oh Lord, even as you have promised that you would do so and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.